Hi everyone, today I'm going to look at a choral work by the Swiss composer Heinz Holliger, Der Winter 3, a section from the monumental Scardinelli Zyklus, a work lasting nearly three hours. First I'll provide some background information on Holliger, next I'll look at the text, which is by the German Romantic poet Friedrich Hilderlin, and finally I'll take you through the arcane labyrinth of the score itself. Heinz Holliger is a musician who has interested me for a long time. Holliger is a phenomenon. He's a prolific composer, an oboist who has permanently redefined the parameters of his instrument, a pianist, and a conductor. When I was young, I was influenced in my decision to choose the oboe as my main instrument because I was so addicted to listening to Holliger's recordings of the Bach concertos. <laughs> I was also fortunate enough to hear him perform live on many occasions, to attend his master classes, and also to interview him. I came a little later to Holliger's own compositions, but when I heard them, I was compelled by their combination of intense expressive power and an air of almost unfathomable strangeness. Holliger is a musician who always goes as far as he can with whatever he's doing, and his compositions are no exception. This is music that demands a lot of the listener, but it also richly repays your attention. In the 1970s, Holliger began writing what many consider to be his magnum opus, the nearly three-hour-long Scardinelli Zyklus, or Scardinelli Cycle. This huge work consists of two distinct but interlocking cycles, a choral cycle called Die Jahreszeiten, or The Seasons, and an instrumental cycle of pieces, many of which feature the flute as a solo instrument. The two cycles relate to and comment upon each other, but both are derived from a single source, the late poems of the enigmatic German Romantic poet Friedrich Hölderlin. Hölderlin, who probably suffered from schizophrenia, lived alone in a tower for the last 36 years of his life, writing a series of poems under the pen name or persona of Scaldanelli. The poems, mysteriously, are assigned completely fictitious composition dates ranging from 1648 to 1940, and are signed Mit Untertenigkeit Scardinelli, with humility, Scardinelli. The first Scardinelli poems were written in 1838, five years before the poet's death. Most of these poems have, as their title, one of the four seasons, but they're strangely lacking in personal insights and feelings. They have a certain expressive blankness to them, as though the human subject were somehow mysteriously absent. Sometimes they don't even particularly relate to the season alluded to in the title. Ultimately, these are poems about the passage of time, emptiness, and pure, transcendent duration. Holliger's Scaldinelli Zyklus is similarly stark and haunting. In the Jahreszeiten cycle of vocal pieces, Holliger sets each poem to music using a variety of wildly innovative techniques. For instance, in one of the pieces, each singer must feel their own pulse in order to determine the tempo at which they are to sing their own part, ensuring that each singer moves at their own speed, governed by their individual physical state. Of course, the music can speed up or slow down, depending on their pulse rate. Before we look at the music, I'm going to read the text of the poem by Hilderlin, translated into English by Michael Hamburger. When pale snow beautifies the meadowland and high effulgence from the wide plain blinks, summer attracts us from a distance, and often mild spring draws near while the hour sinks. The glorious prospect is, the air is rarer, the wood is bright, no person, no wayfarer, walks roads now too remote, the calm maintains sublimity, and yet how laughter reigns. Spring does not shine with blossoms' color ranges, so pleasing humankind, but stars are bright against the sky above, a welcome sight, like the far sky that hardly ever changes. The rivers are like plains, the shapes of wildness are scattered also, more revealed the mildness of life continues, and our city's traces appear most clearly in unmeasured spaces. For Hölderlin, winter is a season of absolute stasis and blankness.
a season in which mankind is simply absent and everything is remote, silent, and still. As you'll see, Holliger admirably brings out the qualities of this poem in his setting. Holliger's Jahreszeiten cycle is considered by many to be among the most innovative and satisfying choral works of the last 50 years. I chose to analyze Der Winter 3 because I think it's a superb lesson in economy of means and sharpness of focus. On the one hand, the technical construction of this piece is fairly straightforward, but the relationship between the construction and what we actually perceive is anything but simple. Let's have a look at the score. The first thing we see in the very first bar of the top staff is a C major triad in close position. So now let's look a little farther down the page. Here we see an additional staff for three tuned wine glasses, also playing a C major triad in close position. The glasses continue playing these three notes throughout the entire piece. So whatever the choir sings is heard against this static, unchanging backdrop. This is quite unusual in itself when you consider the context. So in the late 1970s, early 1980s, the international trend was towards the most extreme complexity possible, as perhaps best personified by the English composer Brian Fernihau, whose music I've already looked at on this channel. So starting a piece with a simple C major triad was not exactly in keeping with the spirit of the times, at least in the new music world. One of the interesting things about that, though, is that a C major triad has the quality, harmonically, of being extremely stable. It simply doesn't need to go anywhere. In other words, it's a perfect metaphor for the sort of pure, icy stillness described by Hölderlin in his poem, and it's rendered even more potent by Holliger's ingenious use of the three tuned glasses. So returning to the top vocal stuff, we see that the next sound is also a C major triad, but you'll notice that Holliger uses special accidental signs with little arrows pointing up or down. This means that the triad is to be played either a quarter tone higher or lower, so right away we can see that this is a microtonal piece. So for those who may not be familiar with the term microtonal, it simply means music that is made using intervals smaller than the smallest interval in the Western tempered scale, the semitone. So in other words, the smallest space between two notes that you can play on a piano. Lots of music around the world uses microtones. They're quite common in southern Indian music, for example. But it's only been fairly recently that they've been integrated into Western classical music, which evolved over the centuries to use a 12-note, equal-tempered chromatic scale. These tiny intervals are very hard to sing in tune, and Holliger makes it even harder by the fact that they are written in parallel motion. That would maybe be manageable, although still certainly very difficult, if that were all the singers had to be doing. But in this piece, there are four groups of singers, each of them singing different microtonal triads at the same time. So the piece certainly requires considerable rehearsal time and great concentration and technical perfection in order to sing it as written. So let's have a look at the way rhythm is treated in this piece. Many of Holliger's works from the 1970s onwards reject the standard rational metrical system of rhythmic notation in favor of a graphic notation in which you have time slices. So for example, given a particular system on the page, you might be allotted 10 seconds to perform whatever is present on that system. But the individual performers can determine for themselves precisely how long each event must last, provided that they play all the notes within that particular time slice. This is a form of notation that was also used in a different manner by Morton Feldman in some of his graph pieces from the 1950s and 1960s. If you're interested in knowing more about Feldman's notational innovations, you might have a look at the video that I produced on his piece, Bass Clarinet and Percussion. So the graphic notation here, employed by Holliger, ensures that the performers will be in a certain temporal relationship to each other, without necessarily having to refer to a stable pulse, and it also lends the music a certain floating quality. The three performers in each of the four choral groups are kept in time with each other by a conductor who gives the entries for each chord. You'll also notice that the choral writing here is mostly syllabic, which simply means that you have exactly one note to correspond to each syllable of the original poem. This is in contrast to melismatic, or more richly ornamented, vocal music, in which you might have a single word or syllable stretched out across multiple different pitches. There's also a spatial dimension to this composition as the composer instructs the four groups of three singers to stand as far away from each other as they can in the concert hall. So the combination of these four spatialized choral groups with the tuned glasses distantly playing this very soft, static music is completely magical in a performance. So from a formal point of view, this music is very clearly articulated, in other words, 
divided up into sections by a simple but ingenious device. Holliger has a group of four singers, preferably four basses, doubling the notes played by the tuned glasses in various chord spacings and octave placements. So at first the basses play very low sounds that give weight to and strengthen the resonance of the tuned glasses. But each time we pass to a new stanza of the poem, and remember that this is a poem written in four stanzas, the singers temporarily fall silent, and the basses sing a long, slow, soft glissando up to a higher register. By the end of the piece, the basses are playing in unison and in the same close spacing as the tuned glasses. So gradually, Holliger starts with this widely spaced harmony and then gradually reduces it down to a unison sonority at the end, and that's when we have this most sort of perfect silence and stillness. Another metaphor for the poem. So there's a kind of uh, subtle quasi-linear process at play here in this piece, despite the apparent stasis of the music. So the Hölderlin poem is written in four rhyming stanzas of four lines each, but instead of presenting them linearly in a sequence, Holliger superimposes the four stanzas, assigning each one to a different group of singers. So for example, the first group of singers sings the first stanza, while at the same time the second group of singers presents the second stanza, and so on and so forth. So the four stanzas are heard simultaneously, one line at a time. So how does Heinz Holliger structure a piece like this? Are the microtonal triads simply worked out intuitively, or is there something else going on here? Since this is a work by Holliger, who is very fond of incorporating classical and Renaissance techniques into his writing and combining them with a very imaginative approach to sonority, we can certainly imagine that there's something of the order of a complex structural process going on here. And indeed, when you look a little bit closer at the music, you see that there are all sorts of things going on here that easily escape the listener's perception, but which are nevertheless quite important. So I'm going to try to pull those apart now, and we can sort of have a closer look at how this piece functions. So looking at the score a little bit more closely, we can immediately see that there's something rather sophisticated going on here. To show what I mean, I've created a little reproduction of the score, reducing the triads down to their fundamental pitch to reveal the inner structure of this music more clearly. I've also divided up the music into lines. So in my reduction here, each bar line corresponds to one line of the original poem. So let's examine the first few syllables of the top vocal line here. Wenn blache Schnee verschönert, when pallid snow beautifies. We have the pitches C natural, C one quarter sharp, C sharp, B natural, B one quarter sharp, C three quarters sharp, and D natural. The entire vocal line here is confined to the space between B natural and D natural, in other words, a minor third. When you count up all the chromatic pitches contained within that space, you get four, B, C, C sharp, and D. But when you add in the quarter tones, you get seven. Later on in this piece, Holliger expands the vocal range to cover the space from the A below middle C to the E flat above it, in other words, a tritone. Nevertheless, all of the singers in this piece are confined to the same narrow register, which never goes beyond the tritone. If we examine line two of the third group of singers, we see exactly the same pitches, C, C one quarter sharp, C sharp, and so on. So we can see right away that there's a kind of imitation going on, which would certainly bring to mind the technique of the canon. In other words, a composition in which the same musical line is heard, superimposed upon itself, and staggered in time. But it doesn't end there. Now let's look at what the second group of singers is doing. At first glance, these pitches don't seem related to the first line of the first group, but if you read them backwards, you see that it's once again the same order. C, C one quarter sharp, C sharp, etc. So this is a backwards or retrograded form of the same line. So now let's have a look at the fourth line. So again, at first glance, this seems to be unrelated to what the first group of singers is doing, but if we ignore the order of pitches and read them backwards, and only look at the intervals between one note and the next, we see a rising quarter tone, another rising quarter tone, a descending major second, a rising quarter tone, and so on. Returning to line one of the first group of singers, we see a falling quarter tone, another falling quarter tone, an ascending major second, 
a falling quarter tone, and so on. So it's the exact same sequence of intervals, but flipped backwards and transposed a quarter tone higher, and also inverted, which means that whenever you have a falling interval in line one, you have a rising interval in line four. So finally, here's line three of the third group of singers. This is a transposed retrograde of the first group of singers, inverted and transposed a minor second higher. So the first group of singers presents four different melodic lines, one corresponding to each line of the first stanza of Hölderlin's poem. The other groups of singers present retrogrades, inversions, retrograde inversions, and various transpositions of these four lines, meaning that the entire polyphonic web of this piece is generated out of only a single melodic sequence. So here's an annotated reduction, just so you can see the overall structure of the whole piece. You might legitimately wonder what the utility is of having such an arcane formal organization for a piece that offers no clue whatsoever to its actual canonic construction when you're listening to it. It's completely impossible to perceive this structure when you're listening to the piece because of the multiple superpositions of tiny intervals cramped into such a narrow vocal range. But this is something that's really emblematic of Holliger's entire approach to his art. He often starts with a simple idea, such as a canon, or a gradual descent and takes it as far as it can possibly go, maybe even to the point where the generative technique ends up completely buried or so radically transfigured that it's completely unrecognizable. Holliger is a composer who's obsessed with limits and extremes. How far can you push an idea, expression, or a technique? So while we probably can't directly perceive these structures while we're listening, they do nonetheless generate a certain surface quality that orients our perception. The attentive listener can easily determine that the music is contrapuntal and polyphonic, without necessarily knowing exactly how this counterpoint is structured. You're much likelier simply to be carried along by the haunting sonority of this music, which anyway is the ultimate point of listening to it. Heinz Holliger offers the attentive listener an alternative experience of time in his Scardinelli Zyklus. Everything here appears as frozen, unchanging, and yet completely haunting and captivating. If you enjoyed this piece, there's a recording of the complete cycle on ECM records, and I would certainly recommend this to anybody who's interested in contemporary composition, in choral music, in the work of Heinz Holliger. This is a really a very important release. So check this out if you get a chance, and thanks for watching. If you like this channel, support it. Your help allows me to keep on making high quality music education videos available to anyone around the world who wants to watch them at any time for free. Check out the rewards for varying levels of support at www.patreon.com/samuelandreev. Thanks for watching.